really appreciated getting to know Brother Curtis Knapp. He's uh, one of those guys that uh, does what I try to do, and that is think well through what I want to say before I undertake to say it. And uh, he does a better job at it than I do, but uh, that's that he does the same thing. He just does it better. So uh, pastor of New Hope Baptist Church in Seneca, Kansas. And uh, I know a lot of you kind of scorn Kansas, but it's a pretty place where they live. And uh, I, I really, really have enjoyed going up there. Looking forward to going back in September. Our SGBF meeting is going to be held there in September. And... Uh, Brother Curtis is also the new uh, general editor for our Sovereign Grace Baptist Fellowship, Mission, Sovereign Grace Messenger, is what I'm trying to spit out. But uh, I have asked him to come and speak, and uh, are we working, Miss Greta? Okay, very good. I've asked him to come and speak for this portion of it, and uh, we've talked about the uh, encouragements to revival from the Old Testament, we've talked about the resources for revival from the New Testament, and I've asked Brother Curtis to come and speak to us about the, the look forward. So, Brother Curtis, come and bring us God's Word. You have to fix things special for tall people. So. I love you, Brother. I am likewise sad that this is coming to an end, but every year that I come, I feel more refreshed and ready to return to the work where God has called me. Uh, someone was just asking me, when did you meet Brother Larry? And it was here. It was the very first prayer convocation that they had. And a friend of mine was uh, speaking at it. And so that's how I heard about it. And then came down here and met him and met all of you. Uh, and have enjoyed it very thoroughly. I would far rather come to a convocation of prayer such as this than go to a conference where there's uh, famous and very gifted preachers that gather together and, uh, you know, a thousand or two thousand people gathered around. Those are fine. And there's nothing against uh, those men. Yeah, I would just personally rather do this. Um, it's far more be beneficial to my soul. Um, um, in light of, of the topic, uh, it's, it's sort of a you know open-ended one, really. Um, a, a lot of latitude there in one sense. So there's always a great risk, you know, there, Larry, <laughs> uh, giving your speaker such wide latitude. Uh, one of the challenges in doing that is to come up with a single text that you would be preaching through like you might when you're going through a book verse by verse. So I don't really have that tonight. We'll definitely be opening the Bible and looking at a number of texts, but due to the, the nature of this, and I guess the way that I prepared it, there, there's no one text that we're going to be looking at. So looking to the future is the general subject. In the context of revival, I think the implied theme is, as I've understood it, that there is hope for revival in the future. Um, it has not yet come. If it comes, it'll come in the future, obviously. Um, but that there is reason to hope that there will be, that God would send one. And uh, the spoiler alert here, you know, the, the question, would God send revival? Yes, I will answer that in the affirmative. Not that he will, that I know that he will, but that we have a basis for asking him to with a hopeful expectation. Not that it's just something ruled out um, from the outset. Um, obviously, I wouldn't come here year after year if I thought we were wasting our time. I don't think Brother Larry would have posted this in the beginning if he thought it was a, uh, something we would do in vain. And I don't think those of you who come year after year would be doing that either. Um, before I make the case, though, that there is a, an argument for God to send a revival, I want to address the objections and the hindrances uh, to believing that. You may have doubts that God would send a revival, and I confess to experiencing doubts myself. Um, from time to time, that there would be a revival. And rather than ignore the elephant in the living room, uh, let's just address it. Uh, let's consider those doubts that we have and why we have them and whether uh, they should serve as any kind of an obstacle for us in reality. So uh, we'll get to the encouragements eventually, but bear with me as we go through the obstacles and, and hindrances first. 
Um, the first hindrance that I want to address is eschatology. Um, it's really one of the most formidable obstacles or hindrances uh, to believing prayer for revival is New Testament eschatology, or at least certain understandings of New Testament eschatology. And for those of you who might not be familiar with that term eschatology, it's just meaning the study of the last things. Um, that is the last things of redemptive and world history leading up to the end of the age. What happens before Christ returns? What happens after he returns? And more to the point, do things get progressively worse leading up to that point? Or do they get better? Um, if they do get worse, does that preclude a revival? Oh, eschatology is not really something I want to tackle uh, tonight, but I don't think I can avoid it. Um, my aversion to it is not because I'm not interested in it or because uh, I'm afraid of it or because I haven't spent a fair amount of time digging into it and trying to come up to some, with some sense of clarity on eschatology. But the problems are as follows. Number one, it is a vast subject. And there are hundreds of verses to systematize in the Old Testament and New Testament. And they have to be considered and have due diligence uh, done on behalf of them. It would take hours upon hours to do that and to have Q&A and to sort of adequately deal with all the questions that there are in that subject. There's four major historical positions um, concerning the millennium of Revelation 20, but as those of you know who have studied the millennial views. It isn't just some narrow thing that camps out in Revelation 20 and has nothing else to say about, you know, everything is ordered in place to fit um, according to certain presuppositions or starting points. Um, what direction did you take at the fork in the road back there? And now you're going to try to reason consistently back to the direction you took. Of course, if you took the wrong direction, you're just reasoning inconsistently wrong. But therein lies the, the trouble. Um, so there's four major views. There's the amillennial view, the postmillennial view, the historic premill, and the dispensational premillennial view. Um, all uh, of those, in one sense, can be defended. I think three of them are more uh, plausibly defended than the dispensational one, of course. But these are some of the difficulties uh, that there is in trying to touch on eschatology at all. But I do have to address this one unavoidable aspect, and that's the one that I've mentioned, namely, do things get progressively worse as things wind down? And if so, is there any room for a revival in that progressive worsening condition? Uh, so when we look at the book of Revelation, of course, you see a lot of sin, uh, worldwide sin, you see a lot of worldwide upheaval, you see aggression on the part of the devil uh, to wipe out the people of God, we see persecution and martyrdom, and whatever your position is on the identity of the beast of Revelation 13 and the false prophet and the whore that rides upon the beast of Revelation 17 through 18, these evil uh, Christian persecuting blood shedding entities are destroyed by Christ in Revelation 19. And with respect to that chapter, uh, even if you are a post millennialist, you should be able to acknowledge that there are justifiable and understandable reasons why many would think Revelation 19 describes the second coming of Christ. Uh, then we have the second Thessalonians chapter two, which describes a period of decline. I'll read that here. But you, you see a, a period of apostasy that will come prior to the day of the Lord. And of course, an apostasy is not something getting better. It's something getting worse. It's people abandoning the faith. So we read um, there as follows in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. That's the apostasy. 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he be as God, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know that withhold, uh, what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send upon them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you see there a picture of this man of sin being revealed, and then there's a great falling away from the faith, a spirit of this delusion coming upon people as a judgment from God so that they believe what is false. And that is the condition, essentially, that exists from that point until Christ comes and destroys this man of sin. So it doesn't sound like things are going to get better, does it? And with all the eschatological views that are out there, as you can imagine, every passage of scripture of eschatology is um, adjusted or interpreted, at least, to fit with the basic premise of one of those four camps. And so there's different ideas on who the man of sin is, uh, when he is revealed, all the details of this passage. Most older Reformed writers and, and pastors and theologians thought, with good reason, that the Pope or the papacy that exists generation after generation was the man of sin. But in any case, whatever your view on that, you, you could be forgiven if you thought that the apostasy described here would make conditions unfavorable for a revival. Uh, people falling away from the faith, not coming to it, is the idea that you might get. You might reasonably conclude that during this period, God is withdrawing his spirit and grace, not pouring it out in revival. You might justifiably wonder if we're in such a period now, of apostasy, because it is very apparent that we are in some kind of apostasy, that there is widespread defection from Christianity, that things are getting worse, just so far as we know, around the world, definitely in our own country, um, with an asterisk there saying a lot of the things that might be going really well in the world as far as the kingdom of God, we might never know about. Um, the media aren't going to report on that. And so it might be happening and we not know it. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 speaks of bad times in the last days. It says this, know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, some point out that we've been in the last days since Pentecost, as Peter said that in Acts 2, uh, that the prophecy of Joel had arrived in the last days. Some argue that Paul is telling Timothy here to turn away from such people who have a form of godliness while denying its power. And that's not something Timothy could do if the conditions described were 2000 years after he was dead. Um, but others would say Paul is, yes, describing things that would happen in Timothy's own day, but also things that would develop and wax worse towards the end of the age. Uh, as we look at the world today, it is hard to conclude otherwise than that the devil has run amok, that he has been unleashed in some way, and that the world is under a powerful 
profound and surreal deception. The level of deception in our day is just astonishing. It's jaw dropping the sorts of things that people are falling into and believing uh, things that you would never have thought you had to formulate an argument against and frankly resent being dragged down to the level of stupidity to have to argue people out of things that are self-evidently absurd. Uh, is that what Second Thessalonians 2 prophesied about or what we're seeing from Revelation? That's the question. But few would argue against the assertion that Satan is actively engaged in worldwide deception in powerful ways. Of that, we can be sure. Luke 21, 25 to 26 is apropos. And though it is certainly descriptive of first century times, it seems also descriptive of ours. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth distress of nations with perplexity the seas and the the sea and the waves roaring men hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken uh, the esv translates that and with foreboding of what is coming upon the world so you start talking to people, Christians and non-Christians alike, and there is a foreboding about the future. There's a heavy sense that evil is brewing, that things are happening and are about to happen, that cannot be undone and stopped. And hard times are already here, uh, particularly for the poor, but harder times are coming and everybody knows it. So to return to the point, will God send revival in the midst of this apostasy that we see? If we don't feel that we have a biblical warrant to believe in a special visitation from God, we're not going to be able to pray for a revival with any kind of confidence. And if we think that the prophecies of apostasy and worsening conditions that we've looked at are antithetical to revival at any place for any length of time amongst any portion of the world's population, then there's no way we're going to be able to pray in faith that one be sent. The second obstacle uh, after eschatology is the badness of men. And we may have doubts that God would send a revival because men are so bad. And we may hold unconsciously to a strange notion that God only sends revival to good men, good churches, good nations, pouring out his spirit on the deserving. But it is doubtful anyone here would ever articulate that or espouse such a view. But there is a more tenable and rational alternative that might be a, a cousin, so to speak. And that is that the evil of men in our day and the widespread apostasy of churches calls for the wrath of God and provokes the wrath of God, not the grace of God in revival. That these are days of Noah. These are the days of Sodom and Gomorrah to whom no revival came. So we may have doubts that God would send us a revival because we just believe that God is ready to pour out wrath upon this world and our nation, not mercy. And we can't just dismiss that with a wave of the hand. Um, if we're going to engage in believing prayer, then our faith needs to rest on solid ground, not shaky ground of excluded evidence and legitimate considerations. Oh, when Judah was near the end of God's patience prior to the judgment of God through the Babylonians, God told Jeremiah not to pray for the people. In Jeremiah 7, 16, he said, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. And describing those same conditions, that same time frame and situation, in 2 Kings 24, 2 through 4, it says, 
And the Lord sent against him, that is the king of Israel, bands of Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. And also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. So there does come a time when it's over for a nation. And the patience of God is exhausted and he is resolved to eradicate his enemies, not spare them. And is now such a time? That's the question. In consideration of the badness of men in our days, let's just flesh it out for a moment. Uh, much of the world, and certainly the Western world, is aggressively putting God to the test. The violence, the glorification of violence, the injustice in the justice systems, the shedding of innocent blood into the millions with abortion, hatred, discord, slander, the sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, transgenderism, pride month, pride parades, drag queen library hours, the indoctrination, the grooming, and the defiling of children. What world are we living in? Sex trafficking, the fentanyl, the meth, the marijuana, the laziness, the love of money, the arrogance and the self-confidence and the boasting in spite of all of this, the foul speech that's so commonplace everywhere now, the blasphemies of God's name, the idolatry, divorce, the destruction of the family, totalitarian Leviathan government, constant spying and surveillance and loss of privacy and free speech and religious liberty and conscience protections, the big brother censorship, the constant lies and propaganda and stuffing things down Orwell's memory hole, the cancellation by social media and now corporations and banks and credit card companies. If you don't hold the right views on things, the social credit, system that's being established, the digital medical passports and so on. And then you look to the spiritual realm and what do we see there? We see the growth of false religions, the growth of the occult, the growth of false Christianity, false teachers, false Christians, false everything. We still have this prevalence of this naive and ignorant view of salvation that equates regeneration with a sinner's prayer or a decision. We have huge evangelical church, whatever that means anymore, churches that are that like to entertain people, but whose preaching is a an inch deep and a mile wide. They have lots of programs and they have lots of things to do and social opportunities, but little else. But what about the so-called good churches, the solid ones, as we might call them? The Calvinists, the sovereign grace churches. What about us? We have to ask that question. Because it would be easy just to, you know, lob bombs over the fence and uh, toss them at all the, the mess that's out there and never look in the mirror. How are we different? How have we distinguished ourselves from the rest of the pack? Well, we aren't entertaining or amusing people. That's good. We aren't flattering people, I don't think. That's good. Our membership standards are probably better than others. That's good. Hopefully we practice church discipline to some degree. Practice verse by verse expository preaching that has merits. But is there power? Is it convicting anyone? Is anyone repenting of anything? Is anyone being added to our number? 
Maybe if you under George Whitfield's preaching, the common description of the response of his the hearers were that they were melted under it. Is anyone today melted under our good, sound, expository preaching? The Apostle Paul said this about his own preaching. He said, in my speech, it's 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Is the preaching in our good churches, and I include myself, a demonstration of the spirit and of power? I fear that it is not. What about the prayer meetings? In most churches, there isn't a prayer meeting anymore. But in our good churches, there still is. But how many attend it? How important does it seem to be? Does it rise above the concerns of physical health to higher matters of the heart, of faith, of obedience, and of the kingdom of God? Our country is obviously in shambles. It's been hit by an F5 tornado. In the spiritual realm, every window is blown out. The trees are all twisted and uprooted. There's water standing in the streets and up to here in our basements. The landscape is, spiritually speaking, just a war zone. And what is our response? How has it changed our prayer meetings? How has it changed our preaching? How has it changed evangelism? Has it changed anything or is it business as usual? We have spurned God. We've quenched the spirit. He's speaking broadly here. And he has departed from us and let us see how we like it when the devil rules. Instead. Okay. You don't want me to rule? I'll leave then. Here's your alternative. Self-rule is not an option. It's God or it's the devil. Those are your options. And when the devil comes to town, he ravages and pillages and burns everything to the ground. If you come to a country where the devil has taken over and blown through, it's like when an F5 tornado has gone through. The wreckage is obvious. You can see the, the swath of destruction everywhere. Everything's mangled. Everything's twisted. Everything's destroyed. And that's our country. And that's our churches. Listen to what the spirit of Jesus said to the good, sound, solid, sovereign grace Baptist church in Ephesus. That was planted by none other than the apostle Paul. So it wasn't a rotten foundation, was it? I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I am come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That church would be rated as one of the best in our day, a good, solid church. Hard working? Check. They weren't pew warmers. Patience and endurance, check. Church discipline, check. Discerning, check. I'm sure they had good expository preaching as well. None of that would matter, however, if they didn't repent of leaving their first love. That somewhat against the was 
massive. They would be a church no more and Christ would close the doors. Well, let me be just perfectly clear. Our churches, including the one I serve, is not going to survive. They're not going to survive if there is no revival. It, they will not be here. And I don't need to be a prophet to say so. The Ephesian church, the Ephesian experiment tells us all we need to know. At this point, you're probably saying, this is your encouragement to revival, brother? Yes, it is. My point is that we need it. Desperately. And we have to fully acknowledge the problem and the need. Remember the Laodiceans, we talked about this in one of the sessions. The problem of the Laodiceans. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and to anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. We're never going to buy from him the white raiment if we think we're not that bad in our churches. The problem is just out there with the Arminians and the church growth churches and the evangelifish churches and the liberals and we're never going to buy the white raiment. We're never going to repent. So all of that is to make the case that we need it badly. Now I want to look for hope for revival. So here are scriptural encouragements to pray for revival in hope. Number one is that eschatology is not a reason to despair. I would suggest that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a much clearer thing than anyone's eschatology. And that your duty to pray, petitions of the Lord's Prayer, is very clear. Whereas there is much about eschatology that is cloudy, about which we cannot be so dogmatic. I would suggest that the outworking of God's plan in the future may be more complex than our systems that have developed over history can handle and process. And that is that instead of thinking of a strict binary either or scenario in which things either get progressively bad, premillennial and amillennialism, or things get progressively better, postmillennialism, God is able to make both things happen simultaneously in the world. The wheat gets better and better while the tares get worse and worse. Revival is poured out here among these, but not here among these. Sinners are awakened here, but not here. The kingdom of Christ expands here, while the kingdom of darkness expands here. And isn't that really, in one sense, what we see in the book of Acts? We see the kingdom of God greatly expanded. And what do the powers of darkness do? Run and hide? No, they, they become more aggressive. They step it up. The devil responds to that with aggression and brings on the heat and the persecution to try to stamp it out. The elect were revived and the reprobate were incensed and grew worse. Secondly, the badness of men is an argument for prayer, not a hindrance to it. If you do any reading at all of revival accounts, you'll know that revivals didn't usually come in good times. But in bad times, those who wrote accounts of the revivals would often describe the low state of religious affairs. 
when God chose to visit and revive and save. And we need to take their words seriously, not look at them as engaging in hyperbole. They meant it. Um, we might look at their good time, their bad times as our good old days. But they weren't good old days. They, the people really were wicked. It really had sunk to a low place. And it only stands to reason. For if things are good, why would anyone be praying for revival in the first place? If abounding sin is a reason against praying for revival, then we are doomed for sure. But it isn't. Quite the contrary. The Pharisees grumbled that Christ came and associated with sinners, with tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus' reply is suitable to our topic as well, namely that he did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Savior comes to save those who know they need saved, not those who think they're fine and are satisfied with the status quo. It's those who know and understand the desperate situation that we're in who are going to cry out in desperation for Christ to come down and save us. Exodus 2, 23 through 24 is instructive. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. There's many other verses just like that, most of them dealing with instances in which Israel forsook the Lord, were given over to oppressors, and then cried out to the Lord to have mercy. But the starting point was not the reformation of their morals. The starting point, as important as that is, the starting point was their crying out. That was the very first thing. The next encouragement is that there's nowhere else to turn. It's worth pointing out that even if we're unsure whether there'll be a revival or not, there's nowhere else to go. If you're on the Titanic and it's sinking and you have very little time left, you get on the radio and you call out SOS as loud and as many times as you can, not because you know help is coming, but because there isn't anything else to do. When many disciples grumbled at Jesus and left him and followed him no more, Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go away? And Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And that applies to us as well, in our case. There isn't anywhere else to go but the throne of grace. If you don't think the desperate nature of our situation calls for pleading with God to visit us in revival, what better ideas do you have? What would you suggest? Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon one time and he was speaking about that situation in Samaria when they were surrounded by, I believe it was the Arameans. You had the two lepers down at the gate, they're looking at the city starving to death and about to perish from famine. And they're looking at the Arameans and they're out there, lots of food, and having their fried chicken dinners and so forth and just waiting them out. And they say to themselves, what are we doing? If we stay here, we perish for sure. Let's go over to the Arameans. If they kill us, they kill us. It's no different than being killed here. Just over faster. But they might there might be a possibility of mercy. Of course, you know the story. They went out and God had scared the Arameans half to death and they went running out and left all the food behind and they went and had a feast. But Edwards' sermon was that the possibility of being saved is better than the certainty of perishing. Another encouragement, it doesn't take a multitude of beggars. We should not be discouraged by the small number of people praying. God is not bound by a certain number of beggars and pleaders. It's not as though we have to muster a large army of prayer warriors. There may be just a few. 
would be nice if there were more, certainly, but God doesn't need more. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the wise. It is his way. He sends the thorn in the flesh so that we would not boast in our own might, but in God alone. He whittles down Gideon's army to a laughable 300 so that Israel won't boast in the victory. Remember what Jonathan said to his armor bearer when he wanted to go, just the two of them, and fight against the far more numerous Philistines. He said to the young man that bear his armor, come and let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. King Asa went to fight against the million man strong army of the Ethiopians. And he cried unto the Lord his God. Cried unto the Lord. Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. God can send the power from above by the prayers of a few. And it's not unlike him to do just that. Next, consider providence. Small groups of people have been stirred up to pray for revival in various places of the world, and this is one of them. Been meeting since 2010. That's no small thing. That's not an accident. Stephen Lee of Sermon Audio was burdened to, and moved to start a prayer meeting for revival and invite Sermon Audio listeners to join back in early 2020. It started with a once a week prayer for revival with everyone who signed up just praying on their own on Saturdays or whatever day. Then in late August of that year, the first Saturday Zoom prayer meeting was held with some reservations about Zoom and not really knowing how that would work. In October, there was a week of fasting and prayer and daily Zoom prayer meetings. And from then on, the meetings have continued daily. And today is day 514. There's about 50 to 60 people from Australia, from the U.S., from Canada, from Central America, South America, UK, South Africa, Holland, different places. And by virtue of participation in that prayer meeting, I've been made aware of various other groups that have started to meet, pray for revival, in various places of the world. Is that an accident? Is it just the work of men? It's not exactly gratifying to the flesh. Prayer is hard work. It's not exactly flesh-pleasing. Isn't it more likely that it was instigated by God and for a reason? People are praying for revival that didn't used to be. People are sending up the SOS. Next, consider the prayers that God gave us to pray. Consider the ways that the Bible tells us to pray and how Jesus taught us to pray. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What prayer request could be more consistent with a prayer for revival? When we pray for revival, we're praying for that. This is why every year Larry incorporates the Lord's prayer into our sessions. We're praying that the Holy Spirit be poured out from above so that God's name will be honored and glorified on earth and that his righteous rule will be strengthened and expanded on earth. And if it is to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then heaven will have to come down. Because it's not going to come from below. Right. What about John 14, 13 through 14, which says, Jesus speaking, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now we know what it doesn't mean, 
But what does it mean? John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. But we know we are not supposed to infer from these passages that we can ask for our lusts and pleasures to be gratified and for the glorification of our own name, but we don't want to stop there and only talk about what it doesn't mean, but talk about what it is a warrant to pray for. Would we really be amiss to pray and ask for a repentant heart for ourselves and for our churches? Would we be amiss to pray for God to fill us with his spirit? Would we be amiss to pray that God give us power to preach so that our hearts would be softened and melted? Would it be wrong to pray that God lend his power for the conversion of souls? And if we can't ask for those kinds of things, what can we ask for? And how did it come to be that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you, really means nothing. Consider Luke 11, 5 through 13. And he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say to unto him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Go away is the message that he gets. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. So if you have somebody at your door at midnight going, and they just won't stop, eventually you will get out of your bed and head to the door. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask him? Is there no warrant for revi asking for revival on the basis of this passage? What about all those psalms wherein the psalmist complained that God seems to be asleep and paying no attention? Almost sounds like an irreverent and insulting thing to say to God. Rise up. Why are you sleeping? But that's what they say. And they plead with God to rise up and come to their aid. One example, Psalm 44, 23 through 26, and there's many others. Awake. Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise. Cast us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. Is that not a warrant? To ask God for his Holy Spirit. And the last one I'll consider is just those prophecies that describe a wide diffusion of God's glory throughout the world. These are not, I don't think, the exclusive possession of post-millennialists. Psalm 22, 27 through 28. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Psalm 72, 6 through 11. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. 
They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Verse 19 of the same chapter, Psalm 72. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And Habakkuk 2.14 turns that request into a, a fulfillment. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One more, Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Was there no possibility of asking God for an outpouring of his spirit unless I go whole hog post millennial? And my position with respect to post-millennialism is I see how they get there. I respect it. And if they're right, okay, I'm not going to be mourning a golden age on earth right. for sure. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying if you have some aversions to post-millennialism, I, I don't think we should just let this be the exclusive property of that particular millennial position. So I believe we have grounds for asking for God to revive us and pour out his spirit upon us. And I also believe that it's the only rational course to take for desperate people who have their eyes wide open and see the need. Let's pray. Father, come down like the rain to this barren planet where there is no water. We look above, we do not look beneath. We look to you, our eyes are fixed upon you. We don't look to each other, we don't look to our methods, we don't look to our industry, or our hard work, our efforts, our evangelism programs. We don't look to politics or politicians or anything man can do. We stand here confessing that our pockets are empty, our hands are open. And we are begging you. You are what we need. You are the answer. Please come. In Jesus' name. Amen. What he said. <laughs> yeah, brother. Quite honestly, that's the best presentation of our hope that I've heard, and I thank you for it. Thank the Lord for laying it on your heart. Thank you for faithfully delivering what God has shown you. I love you all very much, and it has been a glorious time be together. May the Lord go with you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May, may he grant you blessings and the desires of your heart. You're dismissed. <laughs>